that's why my title says Direct API Architecture, but I'm just doing something else. Uh, okay, so uh, to start with, uh, uh, these are new track that we are starting right now, so which is called the IoT track. And uh, uh, what we'll be doing is like we'll be having uh, uh, three sessions. One is uh, this one which is about uh, building enterprise grade IoT architecture with uh, uh, architectures for digital transformation. Second one is an hands on uh, on uh, uh, how to do enterprise mobility management and uh, uh, demonstrating that using uh, Android. And the third hands on would be uh, understanding WSO2's IoT framework, server, how you can extend that, etc. Right? So uh, the first two topics we'll be doing it within today. So uh, and the third one, hands-on on understanding WSO2 IoT framework, will be taken up tomorrow morning. And then uh, after that tomorrow morning, uh, after that session, there'll be like two customer stories coming up, and uh, hopefully we'll have a panel going on. So. Uh, for this session, right, uh, this is actually like there are two 90 minutes tracks uh, on this whole conference and the, this happens to be one of those unfortunately, so, which means uh, you guys are stuck with me for the 90 minutes unless you would like to walk out. So uh, what I thought of was like it's going to be uh, pretty difficult talking for 90 minutes. So uh, I thought of like breaking this up into three main sections. Uh, like this. So, uh, first of all, it, it will be a bit of a uh, generic discussion on how uh, yeah. enterprises can digitally transform with devices. And then uh, how WSO2 can help in that uh, transition, that that is going to be the uh, second part. And uh, some of the key architectural considerations. Uh, that you need to know, that you need to understand when you do that with WSO2 platform. Right? So those are the three topics that we are going to discuss within this session. Right? And uh, probably like in between each of these sessions, we'll have maybe like take a five minutes break, so that uh, all of us can get back uh, uh, to focus. Okay, uh, to start with. Uh, I kind of like uh, came across this particular infographic. Uh, this is uh, from uh, I, I got it from SAP. The reference is uh, uh, down there. So basically, it says 33% uh, of industry leaders are disrupted by digitally enabled competitors. Okay. So yesterday, like Sanjay was talking about uh, uh, Uber, right? Let's say like. Uh, you were running a taxi company, right? And probably you are one of those 33 percent, right? Because like somebody has uh, done a better business uh, with some uh, devices integrated, and it's uh, it's being uh, much more productive and giving a better customer experience. And it also says that 58 of the companies think that IoT is strategic. Uh, that's kind of like I think known. Uh, but something else uh, also caught my eyes. That is, 16 percent of the population will be millennials by 2018, who kind of like are very much uh, in alignment with the technologies and they are like uh, in the connected life. Uh, Direction, etc. And 24% uh, see that uh, it's IoT as something transformation. Right? So, uh, probably like if you are within this particular category, you are already challenged that somebody else is taking away your business, right? And uh, you need to act fast. So, this first topic is how you can do this. Right. And it will also like show how some of our customers have done this like, uh, and uh, some of the general things uh, that uh, we think in this uh, particular area and uh, 
yeah, some of our customers also. Okay, so uh, first of all, I thought of taking this example, right? Now, Amazon, we know that <coughs> Amazon, we know, is like, uh, how many of you guys have uh, echoes, dots, taps? Okay, good. Uh, so, before echo came in, before the dash button came in, right? Amazon that we know is pretty much a digital company, right? They had like uh, APIs for people to uh, sell stuff, people to write applications, other uh, shopping portals to integrate with, <coughs> uh, different suppliers to integrate with, uh, different search engines, right? And also like apart from their shopping portal, the AWS as well. Right? Now, what Amazon did with the Echo is kind of like that, that kind of like took them to the next level where uh, uh, like they, they brought in a device to their whole offering and in kind of like added a different change to their business. Same thing with the uh, dot as well and this uh, van as well which uh, I am not sure how popular is. So, these are very good example where an already digitized enterprise using a device so that they can expand further. And uh, the second example that I thought of taking is uh, a, a traditional industry like the automobile industry, right? Uh, getting into device integration like all these uh, uh, mechanics that are there getting sensors and uh, you can monitor what is happening, right? Uh, so that it offers a, a better experience to its users, that is you and me. So like uh, some of the uh, experiences that are mentioned here, in-car services, things that you get inside the car, like uh, uh, infotainment, music, navigation, uh, answering a call, seeing a message, which probably can get you killed as well, uh, and location, navigation, right. Then uh, out of the car services like figuring out okay your oil needs to be changed or maybe your uh, tire pressure is not get good enough, right? things like that. So basically now uh, this is an industry where uh, it has been very traditional, very mechanical, but uh, gradually getting into the era where uh, by having devices integrated, by having sensors integrated. right? Uh, trying to offer a full digitized experience. So, uh, with that I thought of discussing, now these two companies are, sorry, uh, one, first company Amazon is kind of on the extreme, right. The second one is also like uh, it is uh, quite, can be quite distant to some of you, some of us, right. So, I thought of like uh, uh, going uh, little bit uh, uh, to a lower level and uh, try to discuss the role of devices in digital transformation. So, in this uh, case, I first thought, uh, let us just do this definition, right. Now, most of us think mobile devices, the phones as a separate category of devices, right. So, if you actually like uh, uh, read up about uh, what traditional enterprise mobility management vendors are doing, right, most of them are uh, right now in the in, in the in the transformation phase where they are telling uh, mobile phone is not the only device there are many other devices they call it cpm right uh, and uh, say for example now the mobile phone that was like uh, mobile phone that was there 5 years ago is now expanded by a wristwatch a smartwatch so that like uh, you receive the message there as well so if you like managing a mobile device that means you all need to manage the uh, wash as well. So, uh, the definition devices that we are going to talk about today in includes mobiles and rest of the devices. So, that is the first thing and going back to the topic role of devices in digital transformation right. So, the first type of device that I took that I thought of talking about is mobile devices. So, that is in line with this particular definition. Right? So, these mobile devices are kind of transforming uh, how we work. So, for example, like uh, back in maybe like 5, 10 years ago, right, people used to 
work within a physical infrastructure, whereas it is not so right now. People work from home, maybe like they are out there in the field, connecting to a cloud system. So, they are carrying devices and which means uh, these devices needs to be managed, these mo mobile devices needs to be managed, MDM comes into picture. Then uh, users or employees or like people like us might want to use our own devices for uh, corporate activities as well, which means like I want to do bring my own device, bring your own device BYOD or else it also could be that uh, corporate is provisioning a device for the employee, COPE, corporately owned, personally enabled uh, and then these devices for you to be effective, for you to carry out the day to day tasks needs to have applications. So, those applications may be uh, purchased by the enterprise and allowed uh, to be used by the employees. So, those needs to be distributed. Then comes MAM, mobile application management. So, those are some of the challenges or tasks that we have to take into consideration when we are thinking about managing the mobile devices, the phones, the tablets that all of us use within an enterprise. So, these are like very high level requirements an enterprise IT manager would uh, have to face. So, that is the first thing. So, second thing is going out of this mobile devices, uh, any other device. So, it could be that your organization is not in this category or considering this category or already on in this category. Okay. So, uh, if uh, if you guys are not there like it could be that uh, that you are in, in an insurance industry where yeah, your uh, company is talking about uh, installing a uh, device so that the vehicle how the vehicle is driven can be monitored. So, that the premium can be calculated based on that. It could be that uh, 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 you are in the uh, uh, escalator business right and, and or elevator business like what Sanjeev said yesterday right and uh, measuring how the elevator is being used. So, that you can have a better business model you go and tell the uh, tell the building owner pay us for the usage not for the whole elevator. Right. So, uh, that is the second category. So, basically uh, you are putting up a device so that your business can be transformed in a different way can be generating revenue in a different way. Okay. Now, there are customers uh, of ours who have done this. So, I thought of like sharing 5 stories with you guys. So, that uh, it, it, uh, it helps to uh, give the message correctly. So, QB is uh, actually the uh, thermostat manufacturer right. I am not sure if there is anybody from QB here. Okay. So, uh, basically uh, in this case they are using WSO2's API management capabilities to expose the uh, thermostat device right. Uh, so, that the developers can write applications around it and there is uh, identity management as well. So, that uh, uh, you control the identity and the authentication and the authorization for the thermostats. Okay. And there has been a uh, WC2 conference talk on this. So, this URL actually points to that uh, talk. Then uh, uh, this is actually a uh, innovation center uh, based in Spain. So, basically they are working on various projects. So, uh, one of the interesting projects that uh, caught my eye was like connected retail where uh, they are uh, like, uh, like mapping a shopping area. So, that uh, they get to know uh, when a particular customer stays at a particular location or what are the items that he is trying to pick, what are the items that he has tried. Right. So, that uh, it gives a completely digitized picture of uh, how a customer has moved through a shopping flow. Again using uh, uh, WCD API manager <coughs> management capabilities for like API based access to the data and also uh, uh, analytics capabilities. Then uh, this is also a, a, a WC conference talk that happened uh, about 2 years ago uh, on how uh, Hilti has developed this uh, 
on track asset management asset management system basically this tracks where uh, certain tools are certain machineries are within a construction area and uh, basically uh, it was developed by Trimble right and uh, they basically have uh, developed a platform as a service using a couple of these components like the enterprise uh, service bus mm -hmm. with the mediation capabilities the API management capabilities. Yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, this one is uh, anybody from Yelno here? Okay. Yeah, outside. So, uh, basically, in this case, uh, uh, these in the city of Amsterdam, they have deployed uh, a bunch of beacons uh, within a one mile area so that uh, uh, those data can be uh, uh, externalized. So, that say, for example, there are special monuments and you deploy a beacon there, and uh, you go near a beacon and uh, let us say I am a tourist, I go near the beacon and uh, with my phone uh, enabled uh, and it detects I am near this particular th place and delivers me content about the particular place that I am at. So, this kind of takes away the, uh, uh, the, the, the device that you used to get when you go into a museum. Uh, anybody has gone through that experience having to pay a huge amount to get that device. Okay. So, this is what some of the customers have done. Right? So, are you ready? Like, are you planning to use uh, devices? So, the, in the next set of slides, I thought of uh, discussing some of the things that you have to consider when you uh, want to go, when you want to use devices. Some of the uh, things that you have to strategically think about. Right? So, uh, I thought of like breaking this strategy. I, I thought of calling that the device strategy. Right? and breaking that into uh, several sections right to start with business planning right? so in this one first of all like uh, you need to understand why you want to bring in a device to your business right now uh, before do you do that uh, obviously you are one of these entities in the in the devices world either you are a device manufacturer or as you are somebody developing applications for an existing set of devices. Like in the uh, QB example that I mentioned, QB has developed a thermostat, expose those thermostat values as APIs. So, you can be an application developer who are relying on bunch of data coming out of a device or as you could be a system integrator who is kind of like getting some data out of a uh, already deployed uh, set of devices. It could be that you are writing uh, an Inca application uh, by accessing all the sensors, the sensor data that the car is pumping out. In that case, you do not have to do anything, you do not have anything to do with the devices, but you are just accessing a data endpoint, or else you can be a simple de device user. Right? So, with this understanding, you need to think like okay why I want to do this like uh, what is the industry who are my target customers how they, how they are going to what is the experience that I am going to give which is the most important thing. Then uh, okay you are building a device so how what is the build strategy how you are going to build the device. So, uh, in the case of application developer it is a different set of uh, things how do I uh, uh, get an access token so that my device can uh, I can access a particular device how do I uh, do device management how do I store data on the device. So, uh, different things that you have to consider under this particular phase uh, how you are going to build the particular technology how you are going to integrate the particular technology. Right? Then you have to consider the operational part of it what I am going to do if a particular de device that I am going to deploy fails. How do I first of all detect that it is failing? How do I first of all detect that this uh, it is working, but the values are abnormal? Maybe somebody has hijacked it, maybe, maybe there is uh, something fault, right? And uh, then, how do I, for example, uh, push an update like what Tesla did uh, like some time ago uh, to rectify to the uh, charging problem, right? Uh, how to reset the device? So, what is the operational strategy when I am trying to use a device in my enterprise right? and how do I scale? It could be that uh, 
things work at a prototype level, right? But when it scales, how I am going to uh, deal with that load? Then how I am going to support? Because like typically device deployments can be very remote, right? And it is not as if you are walking through a particular machine and doing it. How do I uh, deal with the remoteness? Uh, obviously, what is the value creation that I am going to uh, have out of this? Yes. And uh, uh, how do I sustain? Because devices tend to improve, right? Uh, with the processing capability, with its overall functionality capability, right? Uh, and uh, what is the platform that I am going to use so that I can uh, deal with uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, new set of features, uh, I can keep on developing application, developing features right? and uh, the, the security part of it. Right? Uh, I am not sure like how many of you have seen this, but uh, there is a uh, news article that probably appeared on Wired where they are asking not to speak in not to speak sensitive stuff in front of uh, Samsung smart TVs because it is on a uh, listening mode repetitively. Right? Uh, so, similar thing like it can be for the uh, Alexas, it can be for the uh, Google Homes right? and of course, the legal challenges associated with uh, Having, having devices integrated into your business because devices can be uh, keeping data if they can get stolen right how you deal with those types of situations right? so uh, i just kind of like uh, very briefly scan through some of those uh, strategical aspects which you need to definitely take into consideration there could be more uh, when you are integrating devices into your enterprise so that you can digitally enable your enterprise so uh, moving to the second topic, before moving to the second topic, uh, any questions? Okay. Right, so uh, I think uh, this is a small demo that we have set up. Uh, Alexa, turn on the light. So, uh, what we are doing here is now uh, this Alexa that you that most of you guys know. Uh, now, Alexa can deal with I am not talking to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, this this person can deal with 16 type of uh, devices right. So, uh, uh, if you actually go to IFT. Uh, it can offer more, but uh, traditional, not traditional, but like out of the box, it can deal with 16 type of devices, right. So, what we have done is, uh, we have written a connector to this person, right, so that uh, uh, we can recognize, right, uh, uh, sorry, uh, this particular device can be recognized within our platform, that is one aspect, right. And uh, we actually call that uh, a connector, connector. Uh, and then uh, we have also uh, written now these 16 type of devices that I mentioned, right? Uh, they are discovered by this particular person using universal plug and play. Right? So they are all of them are supposed to be connected to a single router. Right? <coughs> So, what happens is this guy uh, do a uh, you know, so plug and play discovery and discovers all the devices uh, that are supporting it. Right? So, uh, what we have done is we have actually used a Raspberry Pi right? and we are mimicking one of the devices that this guy is supporting out there. Right? So, that when I say Alexa find connected devices. Starting discovery. This can take up to 20 seconds. If you have a Philips Hue, press the button on your bridge. Discovery. 
Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do now is like I, I mentioned that uh, this particular device right is actually running uh, uh, mimicking this one of these supported devices. So I'm just going to stop that. This is actually this one, right? Alexa, discover the Alexa find connected devices. Alexa, find connected devices. So in this particular case, what's going to happen is, since I, am, I have stopped the service on this particular Raspberry Pi, that is discovery, that is uh, giving it the appropriate response, it is not going to discover anything. Okay. So I'm going to start this again, right? And you will see when I tell it to discover again. Uh, that it will get the request and this guy will respond. Alexa, find connected devices. Start with discover. This can take up to 20 seconds. If you have a close view, press the button on the bridge. <coughs> Okay. Now it has uh, discovered the device. So, if I issue a command now, right? What you to do is uh, this particular piece, which is running on this Raspberry Pi, it's actually this one, right? Uh, would send an MQTT message, right? To which uh, this particular setup is listening to. That's how this uh, bulb band, the buzzer gets turned on. Alexa, turn off the bulb. Alexa, turn off the bulb. Alexa, turn on the buzzer. <laughs> Alexa, turn off the light. So, it does this and then uh, these actually uh, connect to the other Raspberry Pi which detects the this one. Alexa, turn on the buzzer. This can be annoying. Alexa, turn off the buzzer. Alexa, turn off the buzzer. Alexa. Alexa. Yes, it went dead. <laughs> Alexa. Ah, where's Alexa? Okay, it's still connected. Anyway, so uh, uh, so basically, this is uh, yeah, that's fine. So uh, okay, let me get back to the slide deck. Yes. Uh, how was Alexa connected? Okay. So uh, uh, it's like this. Now, uh, uh, what we have done is now. Uh, okay. Basically, we have mimicking one of these plug-and-play devices using this code. Okay. Actually, we are doing. We'll show this on the hands-on tomorrow. Right. So uh, this particular code that I was running is actually connected to the, so basically these two guys are on the connect to the same network, right. So uh, uh, through universal plug and play discovery, this guy di discovers this one. So that it issues uh, voice commands, right. And those voice commands, there is a textual format that you can get from uh, Amazon APIs. So we basically capture that textual command, right. And uh, right now it is only on and off that we support, right. 
so you can send commands. So I can't do a thing like uh, uh, reduce the volume here because uh, at least like from uh, what we have uh, researched on, we can't get that level of functionality. Okay. So. So moving on to the second topic, which is uh, how WSO2 can help in this digital transformation. So this was uh, uh, this is what Sanjeev said yesterday, right? So uh, how many of you guys have used WSO2 other than John who is here? <laughs> uh, who has? Okay, uh, okay, I believe Mohan, you know, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, so you guys have been using us for a while, right? Like, so basically like what we are doing, what, what Sanjeev announced yesterday was, <coughs> we are kind of like uh, putting the 26 plus products that we had, right, under each of these categories, right? mainly because that is, uh, they have seen uh, customers using it, right. And IoT is kind of a new, new area. And uh, why I mention that is like uh, now, even yesterday, I got a couple of questions where uh, now what happened to that capability, this capability, right? So, all of those capabilities are still kind of like somewhere in here, right? Now, uh, what I am going to talk next is like how this particular section, IoT, will help in the, uh, in the topic of uh, digital transformation. So, this is what Sanjeev said yesterday, <coughs> I just uh, took a screenshot of his slides. Uh, Internet, in the area of internet of things, we help to connect and manage all type of devices, maybe not all, but okay. uh, yeah. So, how we started this journey is, we had a product called WSO2 Enterprise Mobility Manager. We are pretty much like, uh, like for some products, we are pretty much even by the customers. So, this is a requirement that came to us from a customer and we started developing a solution, this was about like 4 years ago, right. So, we created a product called uh, Enterprise Mobility Manager back in 2013, right. And we kind of evolved this product into 220 up until 2016 November, right. And at the same time, we were kind of thinking, okay, we need to support a broader set of devices and we were working towards it. And then we realized at, at a certain point, right. There is no point in having something very specific to mobile devices because it is just a device, right. So, if you actually like uh, on the outset, what is the difference between an iPod and an iPhone? Just an application that is not there that allows you to take calls, right. So, if you actually think of a mobile phone like that, it is very easy to think of it uh, in the lines of a generic device. Right. So, uh, what we did was uh, basically uh, going beyond the traditional EMM needs, we uh, supported uh, IoT specific protocols uh, and then uh, like made the device type pluggable, right. So, that we kind of like broke the e product EMM into two, two levels, one is the generic platform and on top of it we write device plugins for different types of devices. So, we ended up having a device type for uh, iOS, Android, Windows, right? And uh, similarly, this particular device type that I mentioned, it is something that we have written. Okay. And also, we thought it is, uh, it would be advantageous to have scenario specific analytics. Right now, we do not have much, but we have uh, some things that are covering uh, some uh, moving dot scenarios, yeah, things are moving, right? So, uh, so, I am trying to explain uh, what the IoT service, what is our objective is, right. Like I have said before, uh, it, it kind of caters to two markets. One is uh, to manage the enterprise mobility device, mobile devices and the other uh, for the generic IoT type of devices, right. So, uh, both of these categories will be served by this particular product, right. And the EMM part of it is kind of a solution on top of the base IoT framework. That is how you are of course going to see that as a single product, but uh, how we, we have developed that is as a solution on top of the base product. 
So, uh, IoT survey is basically you obviously have to be one of uh, fall under one of these categories, right? For IT admins looking to looking for an out of the box solution uh, to manage their mobile devices, okay. we actually have quite a number of interesting clients on this space, right? uh, and uh, we are actually going to have a talk uh, from one of those clients tomorrow, right? Uh, I think like uh, we being an open source company right, uh, and we having uh, those agents that you can customize. For example, you put on an agent on top of the Android device right, and that Android device's source is available for you to go, go in and customize. So, that you like take up Android OS, you develop your own device right, and you can customize that agent part of it is putting us in a very unique position because uh, most of the customers that we have dealt with so far are not traditional EMM customers except for very few customers right. Most of the customers are uh, there are like uh, several customers who are using Android not to manage mobile devices, but to manage uh, other type of devices like uh, tablets that are connected with bunch of sensors that is one example or uh, point of service machines that are running Android that is another example. So, that is the first category out of the book solution for enterprise mobility management. The second category is uh, device manufacturers right, who are looking for a software platform to uh, complete their picture complete their uh, solution right. that is one category. Right. Uh, so, usually that will fall under the OEM. Yeah, they would take us and uh, OEM. Right? Uh, then uh, it would be interesting to the architects who are trying to uh, integrate the device data with some other system, like in the insurance example that I mentioned. You already have a premium calculation system, you just want to enhance how it is calculating the premium using some device data. Then uh, uh, creating analytics for existing set of deployments. There is actually another customer talk that is happening tomorrow on how they have done this uh, at, at United. Uh, so, basically uh, analyzing data coming from set of devices and uh, coming up with insights or uh, some meaning out of it. Then uh, to do device management, just use the platform as a metadata repository. Right? And of course, the, 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 the last category is in the WSO2 cloud, right, where uh, it, is of, it is being offered as a uh, cloud based service. So, uh, at this point, the go to market strategy is uh, first of all, focus on the enterprise mobility management, right, and on top of it, focus on uh, using Android for IoT. Why? Uh, because we have like several customers who are doing that and we thought that could be a trend and also uh, market uh, statistics can also uh, prove it is going to be improved uh, because of how Google is uh, moving in their efforts etcetera. And uh, on the uh, third level make it generic for any type of device, so that uh, you can uh, basically uh, like write to a device plugin for any type of device. Now, of course, this is the go to market strategy for the cloud. If you just download the product, it will not be the case, it will you just, just can uh, uh, do anything that you want, write your own device plugin like what you have done here and what you are going to show like how, how we are going to show to you guys next tomorrow. Okay. So, basically to go a little bit more technical, first of all I want to explain how we understand the IoT ecosystem. So, in this case somebody manufactures a device right, and there are uh, <coughs> the device is useless without an application. So, you write applications right, and then you put into use somebody buys it and maybe uses it and there are set of categories that are monitoring it how the device is performing. Right. So, uh, different user categories get involved in here so, for example, in this case it could be the big factory device manufacturer manufacturing that. In this case, it is application developers. In this case, it could be the end users like you and me, or it could be that corporates who are like deploying bunch of routers or bunch of uh, projectors. And then uh, another set of uh, people monitoring the device deployments. Right? 
So, in this ecosystem we have kind of identified different challenges exist at each of these levels. So, uh, now these are some of the challenges that we want to address in our product, so that it becomes interesting for the respective categories. Right. So, if I start within the manufacturing section, right, it could be that you are manufacturing a device, but and you want to burn in a device ID into the system. Right. You are manufacturing in a batch, you just get a random set of device IDs and burn it in. And then later on you are having a cloud system where at this particular phase, people who are using the device just enters the device ID that is burned onto the chip or maybe what has been destroyed on the uh, uh, LCD, right? like how you would uh, enroll a Nest thermostat right? uh, and uh, it, it gets mapped. Right? So, at the point of uh, uh, manufacturing the device you want to deal with the identification problem. And it could be that at the point of manufacturing you want to integrate these some other systems. Let us say you are building up a smart thermostat that wants that is going to integrate with some other weather services that are out there. So, that before figuring out how to control the thermostat it, 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 it get consults other services to figure out okay, what is the outside weather or how it is going to be in 2 hours time. So, that I can efficiently manage the inside temperature. So, in this case a device calling some other services which requires integration. And uh, now, those are two challenges that are in this phase. Of course, there can be many more, but for now these are the things that we are considering. And then when it comes to the uh, application development, right? now basically you are exposing, you, you should have some mechanism of like accessing the devices capabilities as APIs. Right? And those APIs should be available for like set of people who are developing applications maybe in the form of an API portal. Right. Once they develop an application, that application needs to be distributed. It could be that the Tesla car is getting the update from this particular system, the firmware update. Right. Then uh, at the point of like somebody getting that whole package, the device and the application, right? Uh, you might want to like enable registration, so that uh, uh, only a one valid user has the device. Right. Or as uh, the device's owner might want to share the gate, uh, the gate controller or the motor with somebody else within the family, right. maybe for a temporary time period. So, uh, you need to enable those type of capabilities and uh, listening for events. Then like uh, detecting failures, anomalies, dealing with the analytics, vast amount of data that are coming out of the devices. Right. So, different challenges. So, what we try to do within the product is to capture some of those and provide a solution to some of those uh, areas. So, uh, this is at a very high level how we uh, kind of like envision the product, right. So, uh, there are three layers here, right, uh, the middleware layer, the devices layer and the application layer. Of course, the IoT server lies within the middleware layer and within there, there are three main components, the device management core the analytics and the broker, message broker. Right. And at the devices layer, this obviously an agent that is running within the device, which is what I mentioned when I said uh, we are like, uh, the, which is what I kind of like ran here in the case of the Raspberry Pi. And then uh, different like now these agents can be on different languages, uh, can be on C, C sharp, Java, anything, Python. Right. And then uh, on top of the capabilities offered by the IoT server, uh, there can be different type of applications. It could be that uh, one of these devices at the bottom is calling another device. It could be that there is a dashboard projecting the data that are coming out of the device. It could be that there are uh, apps that are created out of the device's data. Right. It could be that uh, there are APIs that are exposing the device's capabilities so that somebody else can write an application around it. Similarly, it could be that uh, okay, sorry, it could be but uh, we have created the enterprise mobility, cap mobility management capabilities on top of this whole setup. So, that somebody who is having that particular problem can use this to manage the enterprise mobile devices. And 
this is kind of how we do that like some of the internal components that are in place to get this uh, whole thing operated. Right. So, if I try to like explain this in a uh, in, in a more sensible way right here uh, we start with the devices. So, these devices talk either to the message broker right, which at this point supports MQTT and we are on the process of supporting MQP and then this particular call gets routed into the core which is ok. This is actually the same scenario that you guys saw when Alexa was calling, uh, calling uh, the, the this one uh, because uh, it was actually like sending it was sending a MQTT message to that device via the broker. And within the IoT core there are things like uh, uh, managing different operations that the device is supporting, uh, then like managing policies that the device should be having, uh, user management all those are within the core, certificate management in the case of uh, having different certificates. Then uh, IoT core also has this plugin layer to which you can plug in devices, device types, actually device types of devices. Okay. Then there is analytics part that captures data coming out of the devices and does whatever the analytics that is needed. Then of course, uh, there are a bunch of standard device management APIs against which you uh, can extend, uh, write your application and extend the behavior. So, these are some of the core components that are in place and in the case of uh, mobi enterprise mobility management right now we have this uh, app store where you can go in and publish applications and uh, there is an app store where you can uh, get access to the applications. Okay. And this is how the distribution looks like. So, if you, if you go to the WS2 IoT servers page right. And if you download the IoT server, it is kind of bulky at this point because of a certain uh, uh, transitional period. So, it is somewhere around 978 MB, right. Uh, that is because, uh, okay, uh, first of all, uh, within this, there are <coughs> separate JVMs that are available for the IoT core, for the message broker, uh, for the analytics. So, if you guys are familiar with the WSO message broker, it is the same message broker that is running in here just to give the MQTT support, nothing else. And it is the same analytics capability that the WSO platform is having running here with the uh, analytics script that we have deployed on top of there. Uh, and these three have to be started up separately. Okay. Right now, these are big because each of these servers are having their own. Uh, libraries that are duplicated across each of these, each of these uh, JVMs, right. But uh, we are actually in the process of like uh, extracting the common libraries out into a separate folder so that the size can be reduced uh, to a great extent. Any questions? Yes. Uh, yes, actually that is uh, that's some of the future things that we are like trying to do. Uh, we actually have uh, done a bit of a uh, sample. So, basically we have uh, put in uh, Siddhi, you know, you know Siddhi right. So, basically we have put in Siddhi uh, on top of couple of devices and have uh, done a small POC type of scenario where uh, actually we deployed uh, Siddhi on top of a uh, bunch of Android phones and uh, Raspberry Pis right. And uh, we are pushing out certain conditions for those devices, so that those devices operate in isolation and whenever something interesting happens, they pump out the, the particular event. So, one of the examples that we are doing is like figuring out if the mobile phone is dropped, where like uh, one set of values gets accelerated rapidly, other, other set of values remain interesting, right. So, uh, now in that case, it is kind of a uh, yeah, basically we are trying to do a uh, It's kind of a mesh management, right? Uh, so, uh, but we don't have the whole capability uh, as a complete framework at this point. 
but we are kind of getting there. Okay, uh, so moving from there, this particular structure or the packaging uh, can be deployed in, in a deployment like this. So, after this, I am going to show you guys how the cloud is, the WS2 device cloud is deployed. But uh, just to uh, give a understanding, uh, so the, the separate binaries here, right? Uh, first of all, like uh, we would expect a load balance to be there, right? And then, uh, in the case of using a message broker, uh, this of course can be scaled, right? Message broker receiving these messages, and it is going to the uh, key manager uh, to get the tokens verified. Right? So, in this case what uh, another thing that I am trying to tell is this MQT topics are actually authorized, those are not open topics. So, those uh, now that is something that we are doing within the IoT server. Whenever you uh, enroll a device right, uh, basically like uh, so if I actually show it from here right, now, uh, now this is the Alexa's part right. So, Alex actually uh, let's see. This was I guess somebody has logged into the request. Okay. Any so I uh, uh, I'll probably like have this running uh, tomorrow. So I was going to show you that uh, this particular agent was using an OAuth token to communicate to the message broker. I was actually going to uh, uh, change the token, so that I can show you that uh, without the proper token it does not, uh, uh, it cannot send the message to the message broker. Uh, now, that token is verified against the key manager. Now, this key manager is the same key manager that is available on the API manager deployment, same mode uh, token key manager verifier and the same thing that is available on a standard. Uh, uh, identity server deployment or the, uh, the identity and access management deployment like what Sanjeev said yesterday. And then uh, <coughs> this data can be uh, processed by the uh, the core which is where the actual endpoints end are running. So, it could be a JAX RS that is uh, that is dealing with uh, some of the data that uh, this guy is sending and processing it. So, that it detects okay whether to call another device or whether to uh, call a third party system do something and respond right. And then the same core is acting as a gateway right. So, uh, the gateway here is pretty much equivalent to uh, the ESP that you guys know of right. And uh, basically it is actually the ESP uh, with, with some certain features threaded right. Uh, so, basically the road balancer will be delivering uh, these calls to the gateway and the gateway will be routing those calls to the real endpoint. So, if you guys are familiar with the API manager right, it is exactly the same thing that is happening here. Uh, we are just running an API gateway here right and all the devices all the capabilities are exposed as APIs right. So, uh, they are actually protected because both, uh, both tokens right and once the tokens are verified it goes to the correct endpoint. So, uh, this is a uh, slightly like uh, simplified version, but this is actually uh, how the cloud is looking at this point right. So, uh, about a, about like several days ago we deployed the uh, capabilities into the cloud. So, that is what Sanjeev announced yesterday. So, at this point you can only uh, manage android powered mobile devices using the device cloud that is out there, but we are in the process of bringing other capabilities as well. So, uh, in the, in the case of cloud, now in this particular ex, uh, deployment, I was relying on <coughs> the capabilities that are within the product itself, right. But that is not how it is when it comes to the cloud, because cloud has been there, 
cloud already uh, anybody who has established a cloud try it out at least ok. So, uh, uh, cloud had uh, the web application deployment capabilities right and now we have enhanced that to uh, that to call uh, integration WSO2 integration cloud. So, it has the integration capabilities and the uh, web application JAXRS deployment capabilities there. So, you can deploy those type of applications there and then uh, we have the API cloud there which is pretty much equivalent to running an in-house API manager. Right? So, you can publish APIs there right? and then uh, uh, as of very recently we have brought in the identity cloud there. Uh, some of the capabilities that are available on the identity server on the cloud right and also the device cloud right. Now, what it means is uh, API cloud has been the uh, longest uh, occupant there right uh, which means like API cloud already has analytics published in which means like uh, we have we were having a uh, WSO2 analytics capabilities running in there. So, when we wanted to deploy in the cloud we had to integrate with couple of other existing components that are there. Uh, like the existing key manager that the API manager was using, the analytics engine that the API manager was using etcetera. So, it was bit of a integration scenario that we uh, want to do there, uh, we had to do there. Now, that was possible because the components that are mentioned here are pretty much equivalent to what was running here. So, basically the, the key manager component that is already inside included in within the IoT server is equivalent to the key manager component that is uh, available on the API gateway. Same thing with the analytics. I, I kind of like mention this because uh, some this is something very uh, uh, common coming from customers uh, who are uh, using existing set of products and they want to like bring in another product right and they are kind of asking okay I already have X from you running uh, I want to use Y and will it integrate with X which is obviously the case. Ok, uh, this is the third topic. Uh, so, this is kind of like going uh, little bit further in deep into uh, some of the key components uh, within the WSO2 IoT server. So, that you can understand little bit further uh, about like what you should be doing to get this whole thing to work. Okay. Any questions before I move on to the yes. 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 You uh, could you repeat the last part? I got distracted by. Okay, got it. So uh, the the I'll, I'll go to the picture and explain. Uh, what really happens is now uh, if I actually uh, explain this, this in this particular setup, right? When I uh, I will take two, two Raspberry Pis for example, right. Now, uh, those Raspberry Pis now within the IoT server there is a device type called Raspberry Pi, right. And when you go in and plug in one Raspberry Pi that creates an instance of that particular type which is having a unique ID, a device ID that the system is generating. When you go in and plug in the second Raspberry Pi, it is also creating an instance of the same type with a different identification okay. and uh, during the same process uh, if we have configured it such way these device instances would create MQTT topics if it is MQTT bearing the same device ID okay. and with proper authorization set. So, that only the uh, uh, only the authorized parties can access this particular topic. So, now uh, in this case when a device is calling right, it is actually uh, now uh, as of now we only support uh, OAuth tokens and uh, SCEP certificates right. So, in this case if you are using an OAuth token right, 
we internally know to which uh, what is the device ID that is having this particular OAuth token. So, that is how we may make that bridge how to send how to receive how to send back how to share all that. So, uh, uh, this is actually something that uh, we are planned for uh, tomorrow. So, uh, uh, we are actually uh, doing a small programming around this particular chipset ESP. Rowan, you have the other device? Oh, sorry, it's it. So, this is actually uh, how many of you guys have worked with the ESP8266? Anybody? Okay. So, this is actually a Wi Fi chip, right? but this can be programmed. Okay. So, uh, what we are going to do is like we are actually having uh, 20 of these, 20, probably 22 of these, right? Uh, we are going to do hands on tomorrow, right? That includes uh, programming this and you get to take this home. So, uh, we, we, we are kind of like having a uh, small scenario this we are trying to make this a wearable thing. Right? So, we actually call this the alert me. Right? So, this can be one right? and it, it gets uh, alerted. So, this has a buzzer inside and there is an LED and uh, there is an LED here. Uh, so, basically uh, this is we call this the sense me this is a demo scenario that you have created. So, this guy has uh, a PIR and a zona. Right. And uh, whenever somebody like let us say in an area like this when, when people move we get to figure out okay this area is occupied when somebody walks towards it, it gets to know okay somebody is coming towards me. Right. Just think of a restaurant table or a uh, kiosk in a shopping mall like right. you are kind of going away and you have this somebody coming towards it and you get notified through this one. Right. So, we are kind of trying to like build up this particular scenario tomorrow during the hands on. So, uh, uh, now the next set of slides explain uh, the, uh, the steps that you have to do to get something like this on board. So, uh, if you guys are interested uh, just come, uh, come for the hands on tomorrow. Uh, we probably have like uh, 22 devices uh, that uh, we, we are planning to give away. Okay, uh, so this kind of the rough setup uh, that I'm going to explain uh, will be slightly changed uh, tomorrow. So this module is called uh, ESP8266-12E, right? Uh, ESP8266 is the original chip. There are different variants. Very stable Wi-Fi uh, connectivity. Uh, so this guy is going to talk to the Wi-Fi router and connect to the IoT server. Right? Now, in order for this to happen, this is kind of the sequence flow. So, uh, if I take this one step further, this is a device right? and it is communicating via the Wi-Fi to the IoT server. Right? So, uh, first of all, these are the things that you have to write when you want to do this. When you, when you start this, you need to uh, write an device API on the IoT server and deploy it right? and then write an agent that runs on the device. So, in this case, this is actually uh, Arduino compatible. So, we are just using uh, the ID, Arduino ID right? and uh, that agent is written right? and then there is a device API that you deploy. So, that there is an API management control within the IoT server and that device API gets deployed there and you can see and you can program it right. And whatever the analytics that you want to see right in this particular case when somebody comes in front of here this uh, uh, primitive set of analytics that we have done. So, that it shows uh, what is the distance, what is the activity level etcetera. Right? So, that also you deploy. Now, uh, this is now the things that are on, on orange are not things that are coming out of the box when you get the IoT server. Since you happen to work with this particular device, <laughs> this is part of the device plugin that you want to write, that you are going to write. And 
these are the things that are provided by the IoT server. So, IoT server has the authentication and authorization mechanism, it of course has the message brokering part of it right and it also has the storage analytics processing part of it. So, what is uh, mentioned here are provided by the server and the other ones are the device plugin. So, uh, uh, we actually do uh, like the next session would be focusing on uh, uh, how you manage an Android device uh, uh, using the same thing. Now, it is the same thing that is going to be there. The Android phone will have an agent, enterprise mobility management agent running here and uh, the server would have the necessary APIs for the agent to communicate uh, and the server would have certain backend so that it can uh, uh, turn off your uh, volume, it can turn off your camera and uh, do different things. And uh, this particular device plugin is kind of having kind of having a structure like this. Okay. Now, this this particular structure is something that can be generated out of a Maven plugin. So, we have written a Maven plugin for this okay. and uh, basically the outline of the plugin would be uh, this uh, we call it a device management plugin. So, basically this is extending some of the interfaces that we have uh, written on the core framework. Okay. Then there is a device API, this is a JAXRS API that you write with certain annotations so that it gets picked up and it gets converted into properly managed APIs. Right. Then uh, if you want to have certain UIs within the IoT server, you have to write an UI plugin right. and then uh, you need to write certain analytics scripts so that uh, they uh, like they get executed whenever you want certain processes to be done. So, uh, we are kind of like explaining what this is right. So, uh, I said like uh, it, it uh, implements certain interfaces. So, this device management manager is something that is provided by the core uh, framework right and it is uh, implementing uh, this one. So, that it tells basically there are uh, very few set of uh, methods that you have to uh, uh, override. So, enroll device is one thing that you have to do right. When somebody connects this device, what you have to do? It could be that you are automatically allowing the device to be connected. So, no security, no cross checks right or else it could be on the extreme that you are doing a multi factor authentication when somebody in tries to enroll a Raspberry Pi or a phone. So, it is all up to you to write that particular extensibility is there. And then uh, is uh, again some uh, uh, management uh, interface that you have to implement. Right? And then uh, this is the device API. So, basically now in this particular case, uh, uh, we are assuming a fire alarm right. Now, this fire alarm has a uh, operation called change status right, uh, change the buzzer on off. So, there are a set of standard annotations that you have uh, that you want you to write. So, that we read these annotations and based on these annotations we create a properly managed API on top of it. So, some of these annotations include the path, the resource path, the HTTP verb right and uh, then uh, some of the things that we will be using for the swagger right and uh, permissions that are required, scopes when you request for an OAuth token what are the scopes that you have to request. So, if you guys are familiar with the API management uh, this is pretty much straightforward. And then uh, now uh, you need to do the authorization within the code block yourself, right? So basically, what uh, what the device management, the core IT framework does is it provides you with certain uh, interface uh, API so that you can figure out uh, is this does this device belongs to this particular user who's trying to access this, or is this shared with this particular user? So at a, at a metadata level, we keep track of what is shared with whom, who owns what and we make those available as bunch of APIs so that you can do the checks yourself. Now, in this case somebody is trying to try, trying to change the status of the fire alarm right and before doing anything you just check the authorization. Uh, this is the 
UI part of it, this uh, is kind of like optional if you only want to do this because uh, uh, like in a typical scenario you might not use the IoT servers UI framework or UI structure to develop your own application because you want to give a different experience to the customer, you probably would end up writing your own UI and uh, only have the APIs and the back end part within the IoT server. And for the analytics, uh, uh, we, we define event streams right, for different type of devices. Right? Uh, this is actually how we have it at this point. Right? So, uh, basically you define uh, a device type and the events that can come out of, come out of it. Right? But we are actually trying to enhance this so that we take the uh, sensor sensors out of it. So, basically now temperature is a sensor uh, uh, reading. right? regardless of from where it is coming from temperature is temperature right and the type of analytics that you do on top of temperature is standard. Okay. So, we are kind of trying to extract that out into the course framework. So, that anybody who is having a device that emits temperature or that captures sound or that captures humidity can have standard set of analytics or that has a, a, a location that moves all the time or that has a fixed location right. Uh, can have standard set of analytics coming from the product. This is not there yet, but this is the direction that we are heading. Yeah, okay. So, any questions on the device plugin? Yes. Uh, you can't. Okay, uh, because, okay, uh, it is like this. Now, uh, this particular unit right is actually you take the Alexa right uh, because you want to integrate Alexa into the rest of server infrastructure we are kind of like we have kind of developed a uh, what do you call this a gateway right. Now, uh, this between these two setups right since black Alexa is a black box to us it is black or else you get the white version white or black box. Uh, we can't meddle with what is running inside right because of that we can't make this guy talk to us with a token right so this particular unit needs to be together right but what we can ensure is within this unit since we have this under our control we can make sure this guy talks to us in an authenticated way so there can be things that are in here right but not between these two So, uh, that is pretty much about the plugin. Then like I have couple of other topics that are uh, uh, supported by the product that all uh, highlight some of the things that you should be considering. Right? So, uh, uh, as I mentioned uh, for, for the answer to your question, uh, what we do is we, we manage identities for these devices. Right? So, uh, having identities uh, for the device is something uh, like consider something very important right uh, in certain type of deployments maybe not in uh, cluster deployment yeah, you just deploy bunch of devices just to capture data and forget about those. In those cases the device identification is not important only the gateway identification is important, but uh, regardless of whether it is a gateway or a device we just capture the ID, ID of the device that is connecting the system right? and then there can be a case where there are human owners for the device. So, we have the capability of keeping that mapping. This particular human that is mapped from our identity management system is owning these set of devices. So, that part is there. And uh, we are also working on getting the uh, UMA user managed access supported, right? So, that you can use uh, that to share things. Right? And then uh, industrial devices versus consumer devices. Now, in the case of consumer devices there is a human owner, there is like uh, ownership, ownership levels are different uh, whereas, in the case of industrial devices uh, like uh, somebody might want to just auto enroll the device or else like burn in the agent with a certain identification at the point of manufacturing. So, that you just like take the device wherever just power it on and it gets enrolled. So, uh, various kind of uh, uh, 
uh, requirements at the point of enrollment, right. Uh, so, we are trying to like uh, we also have we already have the capability to support different type of enrollments. So, if you can remember the particular method that I mentioned that can be extended. So, that you just like whenever you get a valid ID you just check your backend database ok this ID this ID matches you just enroll it or else you just randomly enroll uh, some devices having a certain uh, IP range or coming from a certain network. Uh, then uh, like you can do things like QR code generation or uh, any or barcode generation anything out of the server because you have the total control of how a particular device is getting enrolled. Then uh, you can also like do workflows so that things like multi factor authentication can happen. Say for example, like somebody's uh, 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 you have purchased a car right and uh, you are trying to like uh, uh, register it or you are trying to uh, yeah you are trying to register it with, with the central system right and uh, on a different channel you get a SMS uh, notification asking okay are you trying to do this. So, uh, those type of workflow extensions can also be supported. Right? So, that is at the device identifi identification and registration uh, level. So, something that is very important when you consider or develop IoT architectures because you are dealing with devices and the devices tend to come in numbers. <coughs> then uh, integration capabilities. So, in this case uh, WSO2 uh, within our integration platform has like vast amount of connectors that connect it to different systems. So, if you guys have not gone to uh, WS2 connector store which is at store.ws2.com right just go there there are close to like 150 connectors that are out there that connects to different systems right. And uh, since uh, it is a built in API gateway that we are using which is also happen to be our integration uh, platform all of those connectors that are out there can be used. So, that say for example, uh, uh, like an IoT device can send in a message which can be captured maybe by Salesforce because we have a Salesforce connector. Uh, then uh, at this point like for this we only support uh, Android application distribution right. So, this is just a chart that I have captured from uh, uh, Tesla. So, these are the updates that the Tesla has uh, pushed for the model S up until 2014. This particular area is going to be very like uh, demanding because uh, uh, delivering reliable updates firmware to different devices is going to be crucial. Something that you have to take into consideration when you are developing a device based architecture. Uh, of course, I kind of like mention this scaling right how to scale like uh, whether you have a now uh, like uh, proper model proper architecture that can scale based on where the load is. So, we can kind of have like taken that into consideration when developing the product. Uh, so, for example, like uh, it could be that right now at this point we are only supporting MQTT as I mentioned uh, and MQP is coming up, but if somebody wants to have an uh, XMPP support right. Uh, how we test it is we just use Google, but you can use something like open fire or anything that can scale and put in here right. So, it is kind of uh, like decoupled system where you can scale up independently. Same thing with the analytics uh, key managers. And uh, uh, about this thing is about cloud. So, we have uh, our own public cloud where you can go in and register and uh, device cloud is part of it here. Uh, but we also offer a service where we uh, we do a managed cloud where WSO2 DevOps does the managed cloud for you and just manage it right. Same infrastructure sorry same setup that we have on the public cloud available on your private setup. Uh, so, this capability is something very important uh, I was not trying to like advertise what we do here, but uh, this is kind of important because you could be developing systems uh, for your set of customers who require multi tenant type of approaches. Now, in this cloud you just go in and uh, create yourself an account which we call the tenant right and uh, it is single deployment, but runs in complete isolation for different tenants right. So, uh, same thing could be needed by your enterprises 
but we don't want to use something publicly available uh, shared by many other customers, many other enterprises that you are not aware of. That is where the private cloud comes into the picture. So, the core platform having that capability to uh, do multi tenancy, uh, run in isolation, right, is something very important. And at the same time, something that you are like we, we did not have that many talks within this conference, uh, I do not think there will be anything tomorrow as well uh, on how we are re-architecting products for the next generation. Sanjeev happened to mention this yesterday uh, briefly. Uh, this product set of products are on a uh, on a carbon kernel version called C4, carbon kernel version 4, right. Uh, we are actually <coughs> rewriting some of our products on top of the carbon kernel version 5, right. One of the main objectives is to scale it down in such way so that it boots up within seconds right. And in order for us to do that we have, we have shredded off certain things so that uh, like spinning off a container containing that particular product will only take like couple of seconds right? which would mean you can very easily scale in and scale out right. And since the footprint is very low the cost of running that particular instance is very low that is the direction that you are going in. Basically, we are trying to like uh, bring down the size, bring down the processing requirements of the each of these nodes to a very uh, low level. And uh, which would also mean like uh, in, in a situation like this, bringing up uh, two brokers or n brokers or bringing up uh, 100 key managers, 100 gateways would not be that much of costly and bringing up and up and down those will not take that much of time so that you can scale up and down with the load that you are going to get. <coughs> and uh, okay, and then uh, okay, this kind of advertising what we have like we support enterprise mobility management on top of it. So, we support some of those things. Uh, we are going to discuss this further uh, in a very detailed way in the next session. So, if you guys are interested just join the next session and we are, we are trying to do it in a hands on manner. We have like couple of devices. So, if you guys have android devices uh, uh, in the next session basically what we are going to do is like we are going to like allow you guys to boot up your own servers within your own laptops and uh, connect to a router. So, that you can have a connection between your mobile phone and the server just try out the product capability see if you can how you can lock how you can set the password how you can disable your alarm etcetera. Uh, and and uh, it, it would not do any harm to your mobile because it is you are you are running the server you are running the uh, mobile device you are having the mobile device at the end of it just uh, shut down your server and remove the agent. But uh, you get to like try out the full capabilities of the enterprise mobile management for the android devices. Uh, we have like some maybe like 3 or 4 devices that some of you guys use can use, but we do not have. Uh, quite uh, that many devices to support all of you guys. Okay, uh, so uh, this kind of the, the last part. Oops. Uh, so, I happen to mention about the device type right. There are other ways that you can extend the IoT server right. So, uh, one is by writing transport extensions. So, let me just uh, uh, go down my slide deck so that I can explain further. Uh, first of all, there is a meta model that you need to understand with regard to the IoT server because uh, basically we are capturing certain details about the device, all these IDs, sharing, everything is kept captured in there. Right? Then uh, writing a device type, I just happen to cover it, we are going to do it in hands on way tomorrow. Uh, and writing transport extensions at this point, we support MQTT, XMPP, and HTTP. Uh, CoAP is almost done. MQP uh, in the in the pipeline like being worked out. Uh, we also have like uh, someone working on OCP for PLCs. Uh, then uh, we also have support for uh, lightweight M2M using uh, Eclipse Leshan. Anybody who has used Leshan from Eclipse? It's a lightweight M2M implementation. And uh, OMD OMADM. Uh, is kind of work in progress uh, for the mobile devices. These two are kind of equivalent uh, one is for the IoT the other one for mobile devices. Uh, some standards some customers happen to ask, but uh, not many seems to be using it. 
it's like uh, okay uh, uh, talking about security like this is something very important that you have to like into consideration uh, uh, so like there are different layers the devices layer the communication layer uh, the cloud right so at each of these layers you need to like when you when you when you are trying to bring in devices you need to like take each of these layers and 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 uh, uh, take security into consideration. I am not a security expert like this Prabhat and a couple of other guys who are there, but uh, what I was what I uh, want to uh, highlight is like uh, each of these layers there can't be a case where uh, a device can openly communicate to your one of your endpoints that will be exploited can be exploited. Uh, and there can't be a case where you burn in a token or a certificate to the device right. Uh, which can be compromised. So, there has to be some dynamic infrastructure where things can be generated, pulled out, etc. Okay. So, at this point, we support OAuth uh, so that device, devices can be issued uh, OAuth tokens and they can refresh, uh, you can set the, the, the validity period, etc., uh, like in a typical API management infrastructure. And uh, this is available for uh, HTTP endpoints as well as MQTT endpoints. So that the topics are also protected, and uh, we also support SCAP so that uh, you can uh, get to get uh, certificates generated uh, dynamically. And uh, in the case of analytics, so uh, basically, uh, I will try to kind of like go uh, fast. So at this point, we are we have certain built-in uh, built-in support for moving dots, right? Uh, and geofencing, right? So that, uh, like, for a moving dot, you can create geofence and do certain alerts, get certain alerts out of it. And uh, we are kind of like working on getting uh, failures and anomalies detected. So these kind of a framework that you are trying to try to do, because failures and anomalies are pretty much dependent on the device. So it has to come from you, like the inputs. And uh, even on the analytics, there are like multiple levels to make it meaningful, right? So, uh, typically you are interested in the solution, this is the experience that you are going to give like for somebody, right. But beyond that experience it could be that you are allowing a certain building to be monitored, but you want to give a breakdown, particular flow, within a fl flow like the air conditioners or the uh, lights, whatever, right. So, IoT analytics have to be approached in a multiple la layered architecture.